Uh, that will be open the, during the lunchtime, uh, which is between 11.30 and 1 is when we'll have our second lecture. It's a little after 10 o'clock right now. So if you'd like to wander over there, walk through the museum, you're welcome to do so. I think there'll be some docents to walk you around and answer any questions that you might have. Uh, we'll stop this first set lecture at 11.30, then we'll have some lunch back in the fellowship hall. Um, you'll just walk back through these doors. We'll give you some more instruction on that later. If you do need to use the restroom directly through the doors here that you entered in, into. This side over here is the women's restroom. On the other side is the men's. Um, there's also one that's wheelchair accessible just straight back. You will see that. Uh, you will see that there. I'm just going to read through an introduction here because uh, it's easier to read something like this. Uh, Dr. Gary Byers serves as the co-director and senior archaeologist of the Shiloh of Excava Excavations in Israel and assistant director of the Telehamam Excavation Project in Jordan. He also serves as the dean of College of Archaeology at Trinity Southwest University in Albuquerque and adjunct professor at Veritas International University. Served uh, at, at various excavation sites, is also a member of a uh, board of directors, the Near East Archaeological Society, there's a mouthful there, and serves on the board of directors of the Associates for Biblical Research, or has served there, and is a member of the American School of Oriental Research. So we'll welcome here, him here in a moment. Let me just pray to open our time this morning. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come together to uh, to learn about what has happened in the past, but also how it's going to affect and change us today. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would be with our speaker, Gary, this morning. Uh, just speak through him. Uh, Lord, that your spirit would guide our time this morning, and you'd be glorified in what happens today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's welcome Gary this morning. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> okay, well, uh, this is... My, my wife, Gail, are you in here? Okay, that's my wife, Gail. And um, uh, she and I uh, were here maybe 12 years ago and uh, for a, a fundraiser for the museum. And so it's just wonderful to, to, to see all you folks. And I met a couple of ladies, drove down from San Francisco. And um, we, we did too. I need to figure out how you got here because the way that, that Google sent us was just awful. So there's got to be a better way. You can't be that backward here in California to have this terrible route that I took. So, uh, and, I, and I have to say, I'm really not impressed with California weather. Um, <laughs> this is not what I was looking for. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> okay, fair enough, all right. So um, uh, we, uh, we're, Gail and I uh, are from Albuquerque, New Mexico. We. Uh, uh, we've been in, in Maryland for uh, around, in fact, lived in a county where Camp David's located. And we've been there for over 45 years and then retired in 2019 and moved to Albuquerque. And um, I loved the work I used to do in Maryland. I was, what was my job? I was what? <laughs> I can't even think. Well, yeah, whatever it was. Um, um, <laughs> I was the uh, associate something. Anyway, I, I, I was the number two guy in charge, whatever my title was back then. I just talked to my old boss yesterday, and I can't remember even what I did. I was there for over 20 years working with men in drug and alcohol addiction at 500 men in residence. And, um, and, it, was, and it was a spiritual recovery program using biblical principles. And um, it was the coolest job I ever had. But it was time to retire and do, I don't know if this is A1 or B1, but to do what I'm doing in archaeology is just such a wonderful gift. And I've been doing it for 30 years, so it's just a, just a privilege to do it and to participate and to read and to study and to write and to dig. But it's just so cool to talk about it with people that are interested. This is just so awesome. Did you really consider when you looked outside just staying home? No? no? Okay, well, I did. <laughs> uh, I, uh, Carl's got us in a nice hotel down here, and I really just could have stayed there and continued my research. Uh, no, I'm going to talk about something just really exciting to me. I, I love this stuff. Um, I, 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 I suppose an archaeological look at the, um, at the nativity, you might guess that I might ruin your nativity scenes. 
All right, now, I've actually given this, this talk, I actually spruced it up for you people, but I've given this talk many times, and um, uh, I've made people mad. And, and, they, and, they, and I've, I've had people say, you're denying what the Bible says. And um, I'm just not. It's, that's actually what the Bible says if you read it carefully. And so I'm going to try to help you with that, okay? And if we, don't, if we, can, if we can agree to disagree, you all people have to do that in California frequently, don't you? <laughs> so we can do this. So we can do this. And I'm happy to, to you know, answer questions and stuff. And already it, it's, it's come up with folks. So you, you heard um, um, that I, I, I'm the co-director at, at Shiloh Excavation in Israel. We say in America, we say Shiloh, and there's nothing wrong with that. But in Hebrew, you pronounce the word Shiloh. So, um, so as an archaeologist, and, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not fluent in, in Hebrew at all to speak it, I, I can read it in Biblical Hebrew even better than modern Hebrew, because in Biblical Hebrew you have the vowel points, and in modern Hebrew you just got to figure them out. So, um, so anyway, when I'm, when I'm in, in Israel, I say Shiloh. When I'm in the U.S., I sometimes say Shiloh and sometimes say Shiloh, so I'll get confused at times. I won't know what I've said. So I, I, I ex, I'm the co-director there, but anybody that knows Scott Stripling knows he is clearly the boss, and uh, I, just, I just support him. So, uh, we're, and we're really cool stuff. And if you've heard about the, um, the, the uh, cuneiform tablet from Mount Ebal, that was, that was our team, uh, sponsored by the Associates for Biblical Research, but it was our Shiloh team. My wife and I were not there. We were moving our, our stuff to, uh, to Albuquerque, New Mexico, so we didn't make it. And I, I'm uh, sorry that I didn't make it, but it just wasn't the appropriate time. And God's got timing for everything, so I missed out on, on finding it, but it's just been a really exciting deal. And then, of course, the Tal al -Imam excavation, where Pastor Carl has dug with us almost since the beginning. Carl, what year did you start? The first year. All right, so Carl's been with us from the jump. Second year? Okay. All right, okay. Well, and he, uh, of course, he got his PhD at Trinity Southwest University, where I'm the, now the dean of the College of Archaeology. So, um, Carl, it's just so nice to, uh, to be here again, and thank you so much uh, for the invite. And uh, we'll be glad to talk about, at, at any point, whether, I, I don't know, at, at the end, I guess, we'll try to finish Christmas questions, and then glad to deal with questions about Tal al Hamam, about Shiloh, or any of these other things that interest you. And I, I, if I don't have a good answer, I'll tell you, I don't have a good answer. I got some thoughts, and give you what I think. But, um, um, and even if I give you a good answer, you may not agree with it. So, you know, we'll just, I'm glad to have interaction with you privately or publicly about any of these things you're interested in. I um, already met a couple people this morning that we just know we had a divine appointment today together. We just know God did that. So I wouldn't expect there's going to be more divine appointments here. There's some reasons that you're here and I'm here, and let's try to make the most of that. So uh, Pastor uh, Duba led us in prayer, so we'll get, get started on this. I think, um, I think I can work this right. So, away in a manger, but not in a barn. Um, I think you probably understand kind of where this is going to go. Um, uh, it's not exactly as our nativity scenes say it. And by the way, there's an incredible set up over there of, of a, a reproduction of what could have been like for New Testament uh, Bethlehem in the time of Jesus. And you just have to go look at that in the museum and take time to look at it because it's really well done. Carl, you call that the Who Collection? The Who Collection? Fontanini, Fontanini Collection. And uh, they, this is really well done. Uh, it's amazing. And Carl set it up, and I'm just, I've never seen it. It's just awesome. So be sure to do it. I took a bunch of pictures, going to take them home to friends. So here we go an archaeological look at the birth of Jesus. So uh, let's just real quickly, I'm, we're not going to read this, but I'm just reminding you what you probably already know. This is the nativity story, the, the, the birth story of Jesus. This is the, the, the surrounding stuff in the book of Matthew. Okay, so Matthew chapter 1 is where you're going to read about the birth of Jesus. 
I was actually going to ask you, where is it you find? I, sh I shouldn't have turned there first. So Matthew 1 is one place you're going to find the birth of Jesus. Where else are you going to find it? Luke 2, very good. So here's, here's the, the next passage, and we will actually spend more time here uh, t today, but they they're both, both have important uh, information, historical and uh, theological information, but we'll spend a little more time in, in Luke. So, so you know Matthew, you know, you know the story, you know Luke, you know the story. So um, this is the story from our nativity sets and Christmas plays. Um, so we, we've got the inn, the innkeeper. Uh, we've got a quote from the innkeeper. What's the quote? Yeah, I got no room in the inn for you. All right, uh, we've got the barn or stable, sometimes one word, sometimes the other. Uh, we've got uh, an assortment of barnyard animals, usually what? Okay, good, yeah, good, 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 all right, yeah. all right. We got, we got our shepherds, we got our angels, and we got our wise guys and the star. That about covers it, doesn't it? Okay, that's, that's, our, that's our nativity set, that's our Christmas plays. How many have a nativity set that has virtually all of that in it? Okay, nothing wrong with that at all. Don't feel bad. I'm happy for you, all right? Um, how many of you won a Christmas play and you played one of those parts? Anybody? Anybody, Anybody the star? Did any of you play the star? Uh, you know, sometimes somebody has to play the star, and, and, and I never was. <laughs> all right, so we're going we're gonna to focus on today, we're going to focus on the, the Luke chapter 2 story, verses 1 through 7. This is the one with the uh, most information about the birth of Jesus. So this is the one we're going to focus on. Matthew doesn't focus on it, he just references it. But Luke really focuses on it. By the way, um, we say that Matthew, uh, written by, now, now doesn't, the Bible doesn't say Matthew wrote it. You, you, you know that. It doesn't say, I, Matthew, am writing this. We don't, we don't have that information, but we, um, uh, but we as assume that that, that that is correct historical information, that Matthew was the writer. There's no, there's no good reason. If, if you believe the Bible is God's word, now if you have a critical view, and, you know, you know, it doesn't matter, um, but if you, if you think the Bible is, is God's message to man, there's no reason to doubt that Matthew was, was the guy. There doesn't have to be, but there's no, reason, there's no good reason to doubt it. Um, the same with Mark. It doesn't, nothing says Mark wrote it. Um, the reason we're pretty sure that Luke wrote Luke is because he, uh, he, he also wrote the book of Acts and sort of outs himself in the book of Acts. Actually makes reference to the, to the fact that he was one of those people uh, in the story. And so we, uh, we think that Luke... And, and, and he ties the two books together, Luke and Acts. So we're pretty sure that Luke wrote Luke. And then again, it doesn't say that John wrote John, uh, but we, we, we believe that that's, that that's accurate. And he, and he, um, he clearly was, was one of the uh, apostles. And, um, and he was, of course, known. He, he called himself, yeah, the beloved disciple, of the disciple that Jesus loved. And in all... When I first read that, I, I was kind of um, uh, bothered me, kind of, kind of like thinks he's special. But then I, then I, you know, I, I got to thinking about it, and and John was, I think John was simply saying, um, yeah, I was one of the twelve. Yeah, I was one of the inner circle, with Peter, James, and me, and Andrew got invited sometimes. Um, yeah, I wrote more books of, of, the, of the Bible than anybody but Paul, and I'm tied with Moses, you know, right? Yeah, you know. Um, and, and so the, he's got quite, quite a pedigree, but he says, I'm suggesting. He says, you know, I really, I really want you to understand who I really am. I'm just a guy that Jesus loves. Yeah, I got all this, I got all that. I, I tell you who I really am. I'm just a guy who Jesus loves. 
I'm pretty sure that's what the Holy Spirit put in John's heart when he wrote those words. Okay, so we're going to focus on Matthew, excuse me, we're going to focus on Luke, um, not so much on any of the others. And, and, and John and Mark do not mention the, the reference to birth of Jesus at all. So, um, so in, in Luke chapter, chapter 2, uh, we've, got, we've got the phrase, the house and family of David, and there's the Greek phrases, oiku and patrius. Uh, so house, let, oikos is actually the word for house, um, and so I, 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 the, and house holds a family, a, 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 a lineage, a group of people together, could be an extended family, and then Patrius is, is the, you know, father, the house of the father. So you got father, mother, and kids. So the, he's, of, he's of David's, he is right in the middle of David's family. And, and who is of the house of, and lineage of David? Joseph, Mary, Mary's husband. And uh, of course, they're, they're going to their, Joseph's ancestral home, Bethlehem. And um, in, the, in the Old Testament, when we read the city of David in the Old Testament, what are we talking about? City of David in the Old Testament. Jerusalem. Jerusalem. City of David is the city that David captured, the city of Jebus, the da- or, or Salem even, that, Jesus, that David captured about the 10th century and in the 10th century, and, uh, and he renamed it the city of David. But in the New Testament, Jerusalem is not called the city of David. The only place called the city of David is Bethlehem. So the Davidic connection to Bethlehem was really strong, and in fact it's mentioned in Luke chapter 2, only in Luke chapter 2, in verse 2 and 4 and 11, so it's it's an important issue. So Joseph, this is a really, I I think this is a really important point for the Christmas story. Joseph is of of, uh, David's family. If the world hadn't changed, who would be on the throne in Jerusalem at that time? Joseph. Because he, he not only, when you, when you, when you look at the, the lineage of, of Mary and Joseph, the lineage of Jesus in Matthew and in, and in uh, Luke, Jesus gets, gets his Davidic setup through his mother in Luke and through his father, Joseph, in, in Matthew. They say, ah, but he wasn't actually Matthew's biological son. You know, correct, but he was his, if you would, adopted as son. He was, he was, Joseph was his, his human earthly father, not his biological father. So Jesus was totally brought up as a son, great, 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 great grandson of David. He was in the line. And, and, of course, Joseph was, too. So Jesus had it both through his mother and through his father. And, and so um, Joseph's connection to the household of David uh, was strong. And going back to the city of David, you know, and Luke's writing this, and, and so we, we, have to, we have to think that the people of, of Bethlehem still held that Davidic name proudly. And anybody that's going to be of David's family line would be special, almost royalty in their minds, because you know it's going to be probably in a great big extended Bethlehem family, and other people are there too. But this is, that's the heart of who Bethlehem is. At least Luke is making that suggestion here. So then, uh, a second important thing in the story is the manger. Now the Greek word is phatne. And, um, and sometimes it's translated as barn or stable, but it's not. It's just a feeding trough. A manger is a feeding trough. In fact, you know, we, we use the word crib, you know, for, for, for little babies. But, a, a, you know, a crib was, was a, a place where you fed the animals. Now, mangers in the Bible world were basically made two different ways. I guess kind of three. They were made out of. Well, they 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 they, they were they were certainly some cases carved out of stone, sometimes built of stone and then plastered over 
with, with, with not so much lime plaster, they just use mud plaster. Uh, we found a couple of those in, in excavation. And then the, the, the third way they would be, uh, a manger would be made, constructed, was of wood. Uh, which ones of those would we find in archaeology 2,000 years later? <laughs> just the stone ones. We don't have any wood ones, but just the stone ones. Which ones did you usually have in your Christmas plays? Yeah, you know, somebody lug it in there. You know, no way. All right. So, uh, and mangers were typically found, of course, on the ground floor of homes. And uh, you say, well, ground floor, I understand, but was it necessarily a house? Um, we'll talk about that later, but I'm going to suggest to you now that you can be looking for mangers on the ground floor of homes uh, all through history all through history, all right? And then the end, um, there was no, the, 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 there was, the, 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 um, she laid him in a manger, a what? Feeding trough, because there was no room in the inn. The, the, the Greek New Testament word for inn is kataluma. And it's, um, it, I, I acknowledge, if, if, you, if you much of a uh, Greek language person, the word kataluma does, does have a, a bit of a wide meaning. But I'm going to suggest and make my case out of the book of Luke uh, why this uh, use of the, of the word uh, kataluma is probably not best translated in. And, uh, and I will, we'll, we'll talk about that. It's going to be... Um, I've suggested, you see here, uh, it's going to be part of the upper floor of a typical house. Although it could be on the ground level as well. But it's going to be part of a typical house. And then I got, um, I got just to give you a little hint, there's another in, in, in the word that's used for in, in the Bible. And it's only used by Luke. So Luke knew what a real in was. If Luke wanted to talk about a real inn, he'd talk about an inn with an innkeeper. But that's not what he said in, in Luke chapter 2. He must have been talking about something else. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, Carl sent me a list of questions. I threw most of them out. They were just stupid. <laughs> and he said he got them from you people. No. Uh, he said he had a meeting and asked a bunch of questions, and I know what I, I, I think I've covered. I think I've covered all of them. Uh, I, I think I will cover them all. But if I miss something during the question answer time, and no question was stupid, I didn't mean that. It was just being funny. It wasn't funny, was it? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Here I am, a foreigner coming from New Mexico and talking like that to you, wonderful people. Shame on me. I will hear that from my wife. I'm sure she will discuss this with me uh, when we get home back to the hotel tonight. All right, so uh, just in the last, uh, I guess over the summer, uh, they, they, uh, were f they found wet sifting, and in, in archaeologists are now doing more and more wet sifting. You, you dig stuff, you dry sift it. You probably have seen plenty of pictures of that or maybe done it yourself. But then after you dry sift it, what's left on your screen, all the dirt's gone through. Big rocks you've picked out, uh, uh, um, uh, big pieces of... of of branches or something or roots, you throw those out. And then what's left, um, you put it in a bag, you, you take it off the screen, you, you pour it into a bag, and you, you label the bag where it came from because you knew where the dirt came from. That was, that was all labeled, and so you, you know where it came from. And then you take it to a, another screen, and you put it on top of that screen, and you, you wet it down real good. And then you carefully, and, and basically, basically what's in there, basically are, are pebbles, small, small stones, pebbles. That's basically what's left. And somebody sits there, uh, wet it down really good, so if whatever's dirt, whatever's on there, you, you, you can see what's underneath. And if you have to do something particularly with peace, you will. So you, you, you look at it, and then you go, and you start looking, and you find, you find beads, you find scarabs, uh, you find bula. Bule is, is the plural. This is a, sorry, I'm looking at my screen. This is a bula. It's a piece of clay. Do you remember in Robin Hood's movies, um, 
the sheriff of Nottingham or, or, or the king would uh, roll up a scroll and then put some wax on, on, the, on the, the, the place where it connects and then stamp the wax. Do you remember that? Okay, well, that's how they did it in Robin Hood's days. In fact, you know the word a papal bull? You know, it's a funny word, you know, and I've, I've had comments, made comments about that. Um, but a papal bull, it simply is a reference to a, a proclamation that the Pope has made, and he has stamped it with his seal. And that's where the word bull, bula, this is a sealed, signed, sealed, delivered document from the Pope is what, what it means. So this is a bula, which was made of clay. So in Bible days, instead of using candle wax, which they didn't have, um, around New Testament time that began to happen, but a little, little bit later. Um, so they, they would use, in, in the Holy Land, they would use clay and, and so roll up a scroll on the, on the edge to keep it closed. They, they put this clay and then they would stamp it with a seal. Now, sometimes, if you know what a scarab ring is, on the bottom side of a scarab ring would be somebody's seal, either their family or their job, and they would seal it. Now, technically, in archaeology, technically, the seal is the thing that, that, that made the imprint. And the, the imprint itself would be called a sealing, S-E-A-L-I-N-G. -E it's, it's not the seal itself. The seal's what made it, but a sealing or an impression of a seal. That, that's, that's, that's what it is. This is the impression of a seal. And this seal says, and I've, 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 got, I've got it up there in, in English on the right, uh, Bishvat, which is in, in the seventh, and, and all, of, all, of, all of Bishvat's not there. At, at the, uh, okay, it's from right to left. Let me get this, show you here. So it's from right to left, and this is Bish, and then we, we lose the rest, Bishvat, which, um, which means in the seventh, and we assume it means year. We assume that what, what's broken off, oops, what's broken off over here. So you see, we've got, we've got broken off here. We've got, that's, that's the edge, that's the edge, um, and it's broken off. So we've got in, in the seventh year, we think, uh, bait, just a little bit of it, b bait, or beth, lehem, it's not the rest of it's there, but <laughs> now, now you know how archaeologists really work. All right? You've got to have a good imagination. Now, I, I think they're right. I don't, I don't have any reason really to doubt it. But you just, you just ought to know when we, when we act like we're so sure about something the, that we just got little pieces and we, we've put it together. And we think it's a pretty good answer. And that's, and that's one of the reasons archaeologists argue all the time, because they say, that's stupid, and I've got a better answer than that. And so we, we go back and forth, we go. So it, it's, it says, uh, Bishvat, in the seventh um, year, Bethlehem, and there's just a little bit here, but there's enough to suggest, because we, we know this happens so often, Lamelech to the king. So we think it's in the seventh year of the reign of somebody uh, from Bethlehem to the king. This would be like some taxes or, or something that was required, tribute, something. Uh, they, they were, this would be, now, so this was found in Jerusalem. So it would be the king of Judah, uh, the eighth century I, I put up there. Around seven, late 8th century, 720, 710, 700, somewhere around there. Uh, 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 this is the kingdom of Judah. And we've got enough of the name to say this has got to be Bethlehem. And so this is, the, this is the only piece of evidence that we have ever found historically that talks about Bethlehem in the Old Testament. This, this is the first piece. So it's a big deal. I, I think they're right. I, don't, I really don't have any good reason to doubt. It could be something else, but we, we, all, we, we know Bethlehem was around because the Bible is very clear about it. And the, by the way, the scholars have found this. They're, they're Jewish. They're not, by, they're not um, New Testament um, lovers. They're not necessarily New Testament haters, but they're not necessarily Old Testament lovers either. 
They, in fact, I don't understand some of my Jewish colleagues sometimes. They sound like they're anti-Semitic <laughs> on their views. I just, I don't understand what they're thinking. But, you know, it's, it's a free country, I guess, and that's what they do. So I think they're right. So this is tribute or requirements, <laughs> bakshish, whatever. It's going to the king in Jerusalem, and it's coming from Bethlehem, and this has been sealed that it's in the seventh year. So somebody in Jerusalem, somebody in Bethlehem recorded it, and somebody in Jerusalem recorded it, because they want to make sure that they get credit for what they've sent, uh, their, their responsibility. So this is the only reference that we have historically, archaeologically, to the Old Testament Bethlehem. You want to guess where we are? Do you remember that, where's Waldo? Um, where are we? Does this give you any hint? And this thing out here, who said that? Way to go. You've been there? Isn't it, isn't it a wonderful experience to be there? It's a, it's a wonderful place. This is the Church of Nativity, and nativity means birth, birth events, uh, the, 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 so this is the Church of the Nativity and in Bethlehem. And so that's the church. Do you see, could you see the form of the church? Let's see if I go backwards, will that do it? Um, ish. OK, there. Um, can you see the form of the church? It's, we call it cruciform. It's like in the shape of a cross. Now, that's the later church. Um, Constantine built an earlier church, octagonal church, and then uh, Justinian built a bigger, nicer one, uh, the Byzantine emperor. So, so that's, uh, that's the church of nativity uh, facing east. The, 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 the top of the, cruci- of the, of the cross is, is facing east. And, um, and so the west side is where the, the, um, the manger square is on the other end of it. And the Old Testament city that we've never found any evidence for, I've circled it, what it looks, what we think, where we think that's located. So the church is right at the northern edge, a western edge, of what we think the Old Testament city was located. Now, why haven't we dug it? Because people live there, and, um, and it belongs to, the land belongs to people, and, and, and they're not interested in doing any digging. And so we just, you know, we can't. We, you, 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 you know, maybe some of you have done some digging on somebody else's yard and you weren't supposed to, but uh, it gets frowned on, especially in the Holy Land. And so, uh, so we would love to excavate it, and we would expect to find what the, the, the city that, that David grew up in and knew, the city that, that Ruth knew, but we, uh, we, don't, we don't have that, that opportunity. So, so that's the cruciform church, and you see the manger square on the west end. Does that look familiar to anybody? Uh, if you've been there, you know, that's the manger square out, out front on the west side of the Justinian church. Um, there is the doorway, and I got another picture, I think, but the, this is a very small doorway that was built into. The rest of a bigger doorway was covered up, closed up, and, uh, and this is all that's left. Um, this is a plan of the church early on. Uh, what do you suppose those dotted lines mean? What's that mean? Anybody know? Those are caves underground, under the church, and right underneath the altar, there's actually two sets of steps going down, going up, and right underneath uh, the altar, is, uh, where the, is the cave where tradition says Jesus was born. In, in, in a cave uh, in Bethlehem, and they built a church over it. Uh, 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 Constantine did in 300, 3, 339. And uh, then Justinian rebuilt a new one in, in the 600. Um, so a little, a little more of a close-up look there of that uh, doorway on the west side of the church. And I don't... Let's see. Well, I can see it, but I don't know that you can see it. Um, there's this arched doorway. And this is the whole original doorway in the west side of the church, but it's been sealed up and just left with this little entranceway. 
And this is that doorway. And you have to uh, both duck down and step over a sill. Now, we, uh, we don't know all the reasons uh, for that. It's been suggested it's causing you to, to bow, whether you want to or not. You are going to go bow to the one to whom this church is dedicated. And also one of the reasons because uh, the Persians uh, came through and, and uh, uh, at, at, in those early days, Islamic groups would come through and they would want to cause havoc and, uh, with, and they would ride their horses into buildings to desecrate them. And you ain't getting your horse through that doorway. <laughs> so that's we, exactly what they were thinking. We don't know, but those are some of the, the explanations. Uh, that's the inside of the church. So that there was, there was on the west side, there were three doorways. Uh, this, that middle one was the one that we saw closed up. And you go straight inside. And then this is the inside of the church. They renovated it but from 2017 to 20. They renovated it, um, and they, they did a good job with the renovation. While it was being renovated, it was, a, it was chaos. It was just awful trying to do anything there. And I'm sorry I went, took a group one day, and we wasted two hours uh, trying to get in and do something. So, uh, but it's, it's set up now. We went again this last year, and it's, it's, they've done a great job at renovating the, the, the site. And... Um, so we're just coming from the back of the church going up. This is the altar area. And on the, if you've been there, on the, on the right-hand side, you can see people standing there. They're going down the stairs. They're going into where um, the, uh, the cave is down below. Uh, so there's, uh, there's going down the stairs. Uh, a lot of times my wife doesn't like that walk because somebody's waving incense and gets gets too much and bothers her a lot. So every now and then it gets really ugly. She says, I think I'll pass on this, on this part. Um, but they're going down the stairs, and they get to the bottom. You get to the bottom of the stairs. You turn right. And there's this, what to me looks like a fireplace kind of a deal. And in, in the bottom of the fireplace is what they call the silver star. And, and X marks the spot where Jesus, where Mary gave birth to Jesus at that spot. That's it. Uh, and uh, the people go up there and they, they kiss it. They put their hand down in that hole. I really don't know what's down in the hole, and I never want to put my hand down there, so I don't know. But that's, that's what they do. Um, uh, so there's, there's another look top left. That's another look. She came down the stairs. She turned to her right. And there's, they call it the Star of Bethlehem, where, where Mary gave birth to Jesus. Then, if that lady just turned to her left, she would see just on the other side over here, between these two pillars, is this thing. Here's, a, here's an old picture to go with it. So you see the, the two pillars, um, early 20th century, and then these, these lamps similar to there. Um, this is where the manger was, according to tradition. So we got star marks the spot where Mary gave birth to Jesus. And then um, it, the, the Bible actually says that she... Uh, wrapped him in swatting clothes, and she laid him in the manger. She's one tough girl, uh, you know. I, and, I, and, and I'm going to suggest there were probably other people around, but she, that's what the text says. So she wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger. Uh, what are those? Those are mangers. And again, what's a manger? A feeding trough. Those are mangers from the, the Old Testament site of Megiddo, Armageddon, comes from the name Megiddo. And so talking about great battles that have been fought there in the past, the Bible says one is still in the future, uh, at, in, in the Valley of Armageddon, the Valley of Har Megiddo, the mountain of Megiddo. And uh, so those are, those are stone carved, not stone built, just, just cut great big block and carved them out. And these were mangers in, at uh, Megiddo. And then here's, um, I, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about these, these houses. And that was one of the questions that, that Carl sent me, folks were interested in. So this is an Old Testament house. This is a, 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 a pretty standard house plan from the time of the Israelites, from the time of David on down, almost to the Babylonian captivity. So for hundreds of years, this was a pretty standard site type of house. We call it, it's typically called a four-room house or a pillared building 
You see all these pillars? That one's taken out just so you can see the, the scene. So it's got three long rooms and one wide, broad back room. Now, sometimes the rooms are broken up so there's six or, or you know, eight, whatever. But uh, it's typically this, this sort of standard form is an Old Testament house type. I really think that the, um, in Proverbs chapter 9, Lady Wisdom's house talks about her pillars. The pillars are inside, inside wall um, pillars. I, 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 that's, I think that's the, the very high kind of house that is described there is, is this kind of house. So you, you have basically one door in the, uh, the narrow, this is the narrow wall, the back wall is the narrow wall, these are the long walls, a door here, uh, a, uh, a courtyard here that may or may not have been roofed. Archaeologists argue about whether it could have been roofed or not because they're going to have a fire in there. But uh, some say, no, you could have a little hole here or in the walls, and the, 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 uh, the smoke would go out. It would be OK. So we, I don't know, and I don't really care. I, I, I don't have a good answer for it. Um, but uh, th so this, this lady is, is um, uh, grinding grain. This is a fire. This lady is fishing. What is she doing? Is she fishing? What, what's she doing? You might, you, might, well, you might have trouble seeing the picture. I acknowledge that. Um, she is getting water out of a cistern in the house. Many ancient houses had, had cisterns. You dig the cistern into bedrock. And, you, and you, if you, the ancients knew if this stone was going to hold water or not. And if it did, they could dig a cistern. You have to bring the water in, collect it from somewhere. We have found one house in the uh, time of the book of Judges that, had, that looks like they had piping coming down from the roof. And we assume it would have gone into it. It was broken. But we assume it would have gone into a, a cistern. And they would have been collecting rainwater off the roof and putting it into the cistern. Now, I wouldn't have been smart enough to do it, but I would have thought it was a great idea. You know, Somebody else would have to build it for me. But I, I would think it's a great idea. So this, this is a typical house with interior walls, one or two interior walls of pillars, stone, stone pillars, sometimes stacked stones, sometimes carved stones, um, and sometimes they would use a wooden post on a stone base. But they would make these, these rows, typically two, but sometimes just one, smaller house. And um, on, on, it, it appears that they wanted there to be open air and ventilation and open sight from one room to the other. These pillars seem to have sometimes, not always, but sometimes a curtain wall, a low wall. Or in this case, the low wall, can you, can you, can you tell what that is? Those are mangers. And archaeologically, we found those low walls with those troughs in between. Now, I suppose they could have used them for something else. But uh, the Bible talks about people having animals in their house. There's the Jephthah story in the Old Testament. Uh, one of Jesus' uh, parables talks about the man who's leading the ox from his house. So people kept animals in their homes. You okay over there? <laughs> I, know, I know you're trying. I, I know how it is. Um, so, um, but if, if you do need to take it, go ahead. You don't have to, you know, go, please go ahead and take it. Um, 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 it might be important. So we, we believe that so many of these troughs that we found were in fact uh, mangers. And so that means if they had a manger there, they had animals there, and that's exactly what I would suggest was the basis of the story. There was no room in the inn. She laid him in a manger because there was no room in the inn. And I'm going to put both of those in, the, in, a, in a house. And I'm going to put them both in the same house. And I'm going to put them all both in the, in the house of David's family, Joseph's family. And I'm going to suggest when Mary and Joseph got to Bethlehem, it wasn't like they had no idea where to go. He was... He was in the direct line of David. The family would have known he could have been king. When he shows up, I'm really certain 
that they had room for David, uh, for Joseph and Mary, and who she was bringing with her. All right, so this is an Old Testament house. We see our mangers on the ground floor. This is a 20th century house in Hassanabad, uh, Iran. And this house, this house was owned by Ali Vase. And, uh, and, and this is the plan of the house. Uh, here's the main door. So what would you call this space? We come in the main door. What would you call this? An open courtyard. This is the open courtyard of the house. You see, up here they stored straw. Here they stored wood. Straw would be for the animals. Wood would be for, for cooking. Uh, then there's a door into a covered area. And this, this suggests roofing. So there's, there's a doorway from the courtyard into the old living room. And then they added a new living room. So they, they expanded at, at, you know, the, at, at a new living room, an old living room. And do you see where the stable is? Come inside the house into the courtyard, go into the roofed area, go through the old living room, and that's the stable. The, the, the animals that, that needed to be in the house for their well-being or because of your need would be kept there. Regular flocks would be kept where? In the fields. We, we got some of those in Matthew chapter 1, and we'll talk about that this afternoon. But this is, this is, the tip, this is, this is 20th century Iran. Uh, they've been doing this kind of thing. I, one, I, I gave this talk one time, and a guy came up to me and said, I was stationed in, I think he said England, during World War II, and I was out in, the, in, in some of the small villages, and he said, people had their animals in their houses. They kept them there. That's where they lived. They, you know, couple, special, uh, cow, whatever, uh, stayed in the house with them. It's, it's not been uncommon down through history. So we, 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 we're not surprised to have mangers in houses because that's where they kept their animals. Uh, of course, certain ones admit. Now, so we, got a, we looked at an Old Testament house, we looked at a modern house, 20th century house. Here's a New Testament house. Um, so, so here's the plan, and this is a reconstruction of what it probably looked like. So you've got, you've got the entrance way here. There it is. Got the entrance way there. And um, it looked like a covered space, suggested to be a covered space. Then you go out into what would we call that? The open courtyard. Uh, we, and of course, if it was a day like today, it, you'd get wet. So you wouldn't, you, know, you wouldn't spend much time out there unless you had to. So this is the open courtyard. Then there's a stairway going up. By the way, um, stone stairways were, were hardly known in Old Testament times. It was typically ladders uh, for the average person. A king could have a stairway if you, if, if you wanted one. Uh, but typically ladders and, and houses. In fact, that, that Old Testament house I showed you had ladder. I forgot. Did you see the guy mowing his grass on the roof? I forgot to... I forgot to mention that. What was he doing? He was rolling his roof. You would roll your roof after the early rains in October because uh, over, the, over the last eight months, it had gotten dried out. There were some problems. I actually should have gone back to that picture. But they, 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 we had wattle and daub roofing. Uh, 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 wattle meaning, meaning branches, daub meaning clay. And they made their roofs out of that, and then and it would get hard as a rock, but but by the end of the summer, it, things had cracked and you needed to patch it. As soon as you got good rain, you put some more mud up there and patched it, and then you rolled it flat and smooth, and and so it would so it would hold up for the next rain through the rainy season and hopefully through the next summer. So he was rolling his roof. We have found archaeologically roof rollers. And so we, we, we know what they look like, and that's, he wasn't mowing his grass. That was a roof roller. So sorry I forgot to tell you that. So here's, um, here's the open, um, open courtyard, and then we've got a bunch of roofed buildings around the courtyard. We come around to here, and we've got the stable, and here's, again, those pillars. And uh, no, we don't necessarily have mangers there in front, but it was... It was they, they tended to design their stables 
with these pillars. And I, I don't know if something about, you know, open air and ventilation. I'm not sure what all they were thinking. But there could even, although they could have been wooden uh, or even stone built, but the, those mangers are gone. But they could find this much of the house. So that's a New Testament house. So this idea of having animals in the house was something that we've known for thousands of years. Um, I'm sure it was done here in, in pioneering America, out here in California even, um, either by the locals or by those of us who moved in later. So I've tried to make my case um, for uh, what, what the Christmas story looked like in Bethlehem when Mary Joseph showed up and baby Jesus showed up shortly thereafter. So we, that was all based on Luke, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Now I'm going to take you to Luke 22, and it's the same book, same author. Um, can you tell me, the, the, the word for in in Luke 2 was kataluma. That's the Greek word, kataluma. You saw it on the screen, kataluma. The word kataluma is used in this passage. Your job, should you choose to accept it, is to tell me which word. It's actually a compound word, it's a double word. Guest room. Where is the guest room that I may eat? He showed them a large upper room, all furnished. And Jesus said, make preparations there. So what do you think? Where is the word kataluma found in this verse? This is the only other place in the New Testament that the word is used. Now, uh, the Mark, Mark tells the same story and uses the same word. Luke uses it twice. Mark uses, tells this same story, uses the same word. It's not used anywhere else. The, the, the Cataluma in the Greek New Testament is in Luke chapter 22, verse 11. Guest room. The guest room of this house, the Cataluma of this house was where? Upper level. Could have been on a lower level, but especially in a tight city confines, you're building up because you just don't have room to build out. So you're building up, and, and um, so it, it was in this house, it was on an upper level. So I'm going to suggest that the Cataluma of the Christmas story was upper room, maybe, maybe not, but it was the, it was the guest room of a house in Bethlehem. And the Bible says that there was no room for them up there. Now, I would not be surprised if Joseph said, I need my wife up there, that they would have done it. I don't have any doubt I, in my mind. It was, it was the ancestral home. I'm suggesting the ancestral home. And Joseph says, I really need Mary up there. And I'm sure they would have done it. But maybe she looked at the ladder or the stairs, or was just thinking down below here, it's, it's nice and cool, and Joe, if you'll put some new hay out there uh, by that manger, I think I'd just as soon stay down here. And, and, and I, I think the guest room, the Cataluma, and the Fatne, the manger, are in the same house, and I think it's the ancestral home of Joseph because he was the, the great, 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 great grandson of David. And they would have respected that and would have been happy to oblige him coming in from out of town. I, I, think, that's, I think that's what the story is really all about. And so I just, I just kind of tie it together there. Now, um, I, I pointed out to you, and by the way, if I'm right, there was a Cataluma in Jesus' life the first day, or maybe night, of his life. And there was a Cataluma the last night of his life. And I don't think that's an accident. I think Luke bookend, bookended the story with these Catalumas. And I'm going to suggest maybe a little reason why in just a, just a moment. Um, so what's this story real fast? Jesus told it. It's a story. 
Good Samaritan, the story of the Good Samaritan. All right? And, um, and we know the Good Samaritan wasn't a priest or a Levite. And he was a Samaritan. And you might be surprised. And, and, by the, and what road were they on? The Jericho Road from Jericho down in the valley up the mountain to Jerusalem. And it is a dangerous place. But along the way, there was an inn. And when the Samaritan found uh, the guy laying there, he did what he could, put the man on his own donkey, and then he took him um, to an inn on the Jericho Road. There is, there is such an inn today. Um, it's, it's Ottoman. It's late, late 19th century. And they fixed it up and made, actually made it pretty nice now. Um, uh, but, but there was an inn along the way and this inn even had an innkeeper. Now, there's no quote from this innkeeper, but we've got an inn and an innkeeper, and Luke used a totally different word. We saw it in the first slide. I, I, would, I can't remember how to say it without looking at it. Um, I, it starts with a P, but I, can't, I, I, have, I have to see it. Yeah, I, I know it, but anyway, we, we'll pull it up if you have to have it, but I can't remember the word. I, can't, I have to see it to say it right. So I should have put it in the slide, and then I could look at it and say it for you. Luke, used, you, Luke did not use Cataluma, only used that in those two bookends. He used a different word, and the same word modified is innkeeper. Luke knew what a real inn was. He wasn't talking about an inn when Jesus was born. He was talking about the guest room of a house that was full. And Mary was very comfortable, trusting God, I hope and assume, to be right down where she was on the ground floor. And uh, she and Joe, and I'll, and I'll bet your family, were there to be with her and Joseph at this time. So um, one more quick thought. Um, do you remember this one? Jesus was teaching in the house. And his mama and his bros came by, and, um, and they said to Jesus, um, Jesus, you better stop. Mom's here. And he said, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Remember what Jesus said? We have biological family, and we have spiritual family. And he was talking... Is he, is, he, is he putting down his biological family? No. Not really. But he is lifting up the reality and the value of a spiritual family. Now, um, in my years of working, 20 years at Helping Up Mission, a lot of my guys really didn't have much of a biological family. Some had none left. Some had some, and they were so bad for my guys' recovery they really didn't feel like they could spend much time with them. And so they, they, they had no family. But guess what? The guise of helping up mission became their spiritual family. And they had family. Some of you might not have family out and about. Oh, you may have family the other end of the country. You hardly ever get to see them. You'd like to, but it just doesn't work out very well. So, so what do you do for family? Church, I hope. I hope you got family. And sometimes, you know, biological families, they're stuck with you. Um, and maybe church family feels like they're stuck with you too, but, you know, we kind of get to, you, we, we choose you. You know, you're a part, we choose, we accept you like you are. Biological family, they wore out with you. But, but church family, well, maybe they're going to out with you too, but you know what I'm talking about. You, you are supposed to have, be connected to family, and I'm going to suggest I think, I think it's a reasonable thesis. When Mary and Joseph showed up in Bethlehem, they went to the ancestral, David's, Joseph's ancestral home, the family of David. And they, when they got there, the guest room was filled. And Mary said, not a problem. Joe, just fix me up down some stuff down here. It's not going to be long. And they, she gave birth to Jesus on, on clean hay in the, in the barn stable part of the house. And then she laid him in a manger, a feeding trough right there in that same house that there was no room in the, in the guest room. And I bet you there was still plenty of family around.
to be there to love and care. And so, I would suggest to you that there's some lessons from the nativity. And one of them is, uh, let the Bible speak to us. We got all these traditional thoughts in our minds. We've had people tell us, this is the way it was. This is the way it's supposed to be. What does the word, what does the Bible actually say? Now, sometimes you got to learn a little Greek, a little Hebrew, or, or trust somebody who does, but you can figure it out yourself. Um, what does it actually say? What's the Bible actually say? I haven't really gone outside the biblical text. I've illustrated it for you with archaeology, but we pretty much stayed tight with what the Bible says. What's it say? What's that mean? So here's what it says, but now, what does that really mean? And a lot of times, if you really think about what it really says, and then what it means, light bulbs go off and go, oh, how cool that is. Wow. What's it say? What's it mean? And then it doesn't do us much good unless we can learn how to apply it to our lives. What's it say? What's that mean? How do I apply this to my life? And or can I share with somebody else to help them in what they're going through? I think that's one of the lessons of the nativity. Challenging what we've always thought, what we've always believed, what we've always heard. And in my case, what I preached for about 12 years and then had to change when I realized that I really wasn't telling the story as an archaeologist. I realized, I'm not telling the story the way it really ought to have been told. And I had to, you know, adjust my, my deal. I had to change my, my, um, my nativity sets a little bit, you know. I had to change the church plays a little bit because that's not really how it went. I, don't, I, want to, I want to give people the best view I can. So that was number one. And then number two, I would suggest the second lesson from the nativity is family is important to God. I'm suggesting to you that Jesus wasn't born in a barn out in the South 40 somewhere he was born in the ancestral home of his father, surrounded by family and friends and people who loved him and cared for him. I think, I think God the Father made sure his son was born into family and love and care. And I would, that would be Joseph's family home in Bethlehem, I believe. Okay, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Um, I, 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 think it's, I think it's an accurate understanding. It's okay if you don't buy my deal. It really is. I'm really okay with that. And I'll be glad to discuss it if you want, but you don't need to. Uh, but I think that probably best explains, and I think it gives the spiritual lessons and insights that make the story worthwhile. Okay. Um, what time is it? How much time do I have? Okay. Okay, we got time for questions. Let's start with Christmas story questions, and then I'm willing to go to anything else you want to ask questions about. Look, I am so honored um, that you came to do this with us today. I, this is so cool. I am so glad to have you here, and I want to I want to invest myself on any level I can, privately and publicly with you guys because I'm, I'm honored to have you and, and we're thinking and talking about something that I think is really cool and really important. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, I'm, my name is Gary Byers. Um, I'm an archaeologist, um, a, a man of faith. I guess you figured that out. Uh, and I, I work, my, um, I, I'm the dean of the College of Archaeology um, uh, uh, Trinity Southwest University. I'm the uh, I'm, I'm 71 this year. I'm old. Um, that's another thing you can put down there. I'm the, I'm an adjunct professor at uh, Veritas International University School of Archaeology. I'm um, the co-director of the um, Shiloh excavation in Israel. I'm the uh, assistant director of the Tal Al Imam excavation in Jordan. And uh, I've also dug at uh, Kirbet El Makata, which we think is I of the story of Joshua and the city of I. And at Kirbet Nisia, another nearby site that we thought might be I, but we decided wasn't. And I've dug at the Philistine city of Ekron. 
That was my very first big dig back in 1984. What were you doing in 1984? <laughs> yeah, that's what I was doing. All right, so that, that's, that's who I am. Um, but honestly, honestly, I'm just the guy that Jesus loved, really. I know it's true. I ain't that good. I'm really not that good. Since you, since you brought it up, I'm just going to say, I know so many guys. My wife says my pants are drooping. I, this is not very good. I'm sorry. So I'll stay behind this. It's better. <laughs> I'm, I, I know, I, see, and I'm being so honest, I know so many guys and gals that are more qualified to do what I do than me. I'm being honest. I'm not being humble, I'm just being honest. I know that's true. So how's come I'm that guy? I got, I got, I got one big answer from, from in my, this, that, this settled it for me. I, I was okay with it. I'm okay with who I am. I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm above my pay grade. I'm like, Psalm 37, 4. And? Now, I am imperfect at delighting myself in the Lord. I'm imperfect at it. So imperfect. Check with Gail. It's awful. It's embarrassing. <laughs> really, I mean, it's just true. And you know, you understand. I am so imperfect at it, but I, I have tried for decades now to delight myself in the Lord. What did he say he would do? Give me the desires of my heart. Now I had a job for 20 years that was just so cool, working with men and watching their lives transform. And now I get to do another part that just for me, for me, it's just, 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 just as cool. I don't deserve it. I'm not that good. But Jesus gave me the opportunity. I'm going to do the best I can with what he gave me. That's who I really am. Okay, questions? You're hungry, aren't you? Yes. I'm sorry, that was Hebrew. I, I, that was Hebrew. You read it from right to left. And uh, that's... Um, that's uh, an older form of Hebrew. It's not like the modern Hebrew that we read. We read the square Aramaic script today, but they were using something different and uh, an older, or older style of the same alphabetic script. Okay? Um, so the... That's an alphabetic script versus pictograms, um, which is like hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics are images that actually kind of give you a picture. And then, and then there's, there's logograms, which uh, sort, of, sort of spell out a word, say a word. Um, but but th this is an alphabet. So prior to about, about 1900 BC, there was cuneiform script. Cuneiform? What's it mean, cuneiform? It's, it's, it's Latin. It means wedge-shaped. Uh, Carl, do you have cuneiform tablets here? Okay, we got them. All right. Cuneiform is made with a stylist, and it's all little wedges. And cuneiform was a, 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 a type of script. And in, Egy and in Egypt, the type of script was called hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics is Greek. Hiero meaning sacred. Glyphics meaning writing or incisions. And those were, those were the only thing the world had. So the only people that could, um, could read and write were specialists. Most kings did not know how to read and write. They just had to make sure they had some guys that could, and then hopefully they could trust them. Um, so in about 1900 BC, in the Sinai Peninsula, we start seeing an alphabetic script that was clearly coming out of Egyptian hieroglyphics, Sinai Peninsula, Egypt. And um, it, it happened in the Sinai area, 
and it doesn't look like it's being done by Egyptian officials, but by slaves, POWs. And I got to visit one of those sites at, in Sinai at a turquoise mine at Kirbet el Sadim. And, um, and I got to see those letters for myself, and they're like, they're written in about 1600 BC. You, you, if you watch TV or you've read many books, scholars say, critical scholars say, Moses didn't write the first five books of the Bible because he didn't know how to write. And there was, it was impossible. And, and to be honest, you couldn't write those books with hieroglyphics or cuneiform. It just took way too much stuff. But somewhere a couple hundred years before, by people like Moses in slave, now Moses lived pretty good for a while there, but you know, in this enslaved world, somebody began to create a, a concept of an alphabetic script. And by the time Moses was on the scene, trained, uh, Stephen said in Acts chapter 7, trained in all the wisdom and knowledge of Egypt, he also learned this alphabetic script. And he was able to write the Pentateuch just like the Bible says. And I'm telling you, there are still scholars who still don't believe that. It's a free country. They can believe what they want. But, but the Bible puts it out there, and archaeology has demonstrated. In the very region where Moses was when he would have started writing, they're using the alphabetic script. And, of course, how many letters in the English alphabet? Very good, very good. How many in the Greek alphabet? 24 in the Craig Greek. And then how many in the Hebrew alphabet? 22. Moses had, now, you know, in those early days, it may have been an extra one or two, or less one or two, uh, but in those early days, Moses had less than 30 letters that he was able to write, take Hebrew words, take Aramaic words, take um, uh, Egyptian words, take Akkadian words, and put them into an alphabetic script. And that's what we started with. Now, I will tell you this. The script that Moses would have used by the time of David looked different. I'm not sure David, if David could read. I guess he did because he wrote a bunch of Proverbs, a bunch of Psalms, didn't he? Solly wrote some Proverbs. But David wrote a bunch of Psalms. So I guess he, he would have been able to read and write. Um, uh, it, would have been a, it would have been a script that David probably couldn't have read because it had changed that much. You ever read some Shakespearean English in ancient, uh, old Shakespearean script? I have a lot of trouble with it. All right? So it changes in just, just a couple hundred years. So, so uh, that would be the case. So does that help you with your question? Uh, okay, so most of the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. There is some of it is written in Aramaic. Hebrew and Aramaic are sister languages, sort of like French and Spanish and Italian. We call those romance languages, not because they're romantic, but, but they're Romanesque, like Latin. They're Romanesque, like the city of Rome. That's, that's, that's the point. So they, they are sister languages, and, and Portuguese, they, they can kind of talk, they, they, they kind of get stuff. Aramaic and Hebrew are quite similar in many ways. Greek is quite different. Uh, but Aramaic and Hebrew are very similar. So most of the Old Testament Hebrew, then there's some sections in um, Daniel and, um, I just went blank. Uh, Daniel and what? Did somebody say? Daniel and uh, Ezra. Ezra. There's some sections there. And then, and then, of course, most of the New Testament, the New Testament is written in Greek, but there's a little bit of Aramaic you know, splashed in there every now and then. An Aramaic word will be used. Um, the, the, we, we generally, we assume, I think it's correct, we assume Jesus spoke Aramaic. The, the apostles probably spoke Aramaic with Jesus, uh, but they did wind up writing in Greek, and they wrote in Greek, because God, God made sure, I, I believe, actually, that, that they are the ones that wrote those books. They wrote it in Greek because God wanted to make sure the whole world could read it. 
because the lingua franca, the worldwide language of the day, was Greek. And in, and in, in, in the fullness of time, God sent his son. And in the fullness of time, just the perfect timing, God had the New Testament written in the language that the world could understand it. Okay, was that, we good? Okay there? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Duba. Yes, I, I will try to. If I don't, throw something at me. Yes, sir. What month of the year do you think Jesus was born? Okay, what month of the year do we think Jesus was born? I think that was one of the questions Carl sent me. Uh, are you going to come back this afternoon for the second lecture? We're, we're going to talk about that. I, I, think, I think there is some really good, sensible, logical evidence to say the range, the, the quarter of the year in which he was born. Us, after, when we're done this afternoon, you'll you, you be sure to tell me what you think. Yes? Okay, Th and that's really nice. Uh, I appreciate um, Pastor and, and I guess Chris back there. Is that you, Chris? Um, okay, all right. Hi, Chris. Uh, thank you, Chris. I see that hand. Um, uh, so that's very nice, and, and they'd be, uh, be glad to make it available to you. And then you, you can correct my mistakes and s email me and tell me. Yes? Well, yes. And and uh, uh, thank thank you. I, I I very much accept that as a compliment. And um, my my um, Hebrew is. I would be embarrassed to be trying to discuss Hebrew with you. I would be asking all the questions. Um, where do you teach? Well, uh, I'm teaching two certificates now at um, uh, Ugaritic. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Ugaritic material. Well, that's wonderful. Now, did you ever get to Serebet El Kadim? Did, did you ever get to Serebet El Kadim? Did you ever get to go? Sarabet El Kadim. Are those churches in this area that you talked about? Yes, in Sacramento. Okay, in Sacramento. So if anybody's interested, um, she's local. That's wonderful. <laughs> that's just. I guess that's local, isn't it? Uh, the, the BC, Baltimore area, everything's local. Okay, thank you. That was wonderful. It's very wonderful to meet you. All right, questions, comments? In the back. What were the kind of changes you made when you learned what you learned? Yeah, so, um, so you know, I was, uh, we'll stay back here. I, um, now I'm, I'm self-conscious here. I'm, I feel like I've got my clown pants on. Um, so, um, uh, as an archaeologist, it hit me one day. I was doing my archaeological research, and it hit me. These, in fact, it was actually um, Larry Stager, archaeologist Larry Stager, an article said, "Well, this this kind of stone basin probably was the manger that Jesus was laid in." And an Israeli archaeologist, who's not a Bible guy, um, but but he uh, just made that point, and I go, "Really?" I've been studying this stuff, and I'd never made the connection. And so I did a little more. Well, first thing, it made me mad, because you know, that changed my, my view. So I, I fought it for about a year. And then I, I finally just said, OK, this is, this is what the Bible says. This is what we know from archaeology and history. i got to rethink what I'm doing. So I, I, be, I began to change the story. And, then, and I'm thinking, well, why, why am I changing the story? Well, because this is, this is what the evidence does suggest. 
that, that makes, first off, the biblical text itself suggests it if you just looked at it and understood a little bit about the Greek words. But then secondly, it's what archaeology says. And then I, I did, when I said, you know, well, what's it say? What's it mean? And so, so what? What difference does it make? What's it mean to me? How do I apply it? And then I, I realized if that's all true, then they must have been in the same house, and that meant Jesus was not born off and alone in a way like we always say. I preach sermons about that. Oh, but he wanted Jesus at their house, you know? And I thought, no. And then I thought, well, if, if God Almighty sent his son, if God sent him, I would assume he'd want to make sure he's well cared for and surrounded by love. So for me, it, it had to have a meaning, and it did. And so that's kind of where I, where I got to. And uh, yeah, yes, ma'am. Uh, when? The when part. The time. Okay. Um, so I, yeah, I'm really going to do it this afternoon. Can you stay? Um, uh, and look, you just talk for me at lunchtime or before lunch. I, I want I want to make my case. Otherwise, um, you know, I'm afraid you all go home, and then I, you know. So uh, I want to I want to get a chance to make my case, and then you can decide. Questions, comments, yes. You, you know, and that's a, that's a really important point, and I, I, I wrestle with that particular issue. Um, I, think, I think two things. Um, one, his status probably would have overruled anything, period. Probably would have. Even he, he, he could even have probably even demanded something if he chose to. So I, I think his status overruled, number one. Number two... Um, uh, it wasn't part of my talk, but we can, we can get in, into it. Um, Mary and Joseph, the, the term for their relationship is not engaged. It was, it, was, it was, there was a bit of a promise because they were legally document, with a document tied to each other. Uh, there was an, a settled agreement but they had not consummated that relationship according to tradition. And, and for one, a, a girl would need to be old enough to be able to bear children. And so the process, you know, for that to be the case. And, and that's, that's when they would typically get together and consummate the relationship. But it would be an arranged marriage, typically, standardly, way, even while they were kids. So Mary and Joseph were already in, in the legal bonds in fact, Matthew actually uses the word wife once. And so she was legally his wife, but they had not come together. And I think, frankly, Joe, Joe and Mary show up, you start to talk, you find out the deal, and then, they, and then they just say, look, here's what's happened. And they tell people what the angels told them. And they go, a little hard to believe, but you are Joe, and she does have a baby, and well, we'll try to, you know, and, but it didn't take long, because then the shepherds showed up, and you know, and then the wise guys, and that's what we're going to talk about this afternoon. All right, we'll get into that part of the story. So I recognize it's, it's an issue. I don't think it was insurmountable at all. And by the way, Mary had relatives where? in the hill country of Judea, and Bethlehem's in the hill country of Judea, so they could easily have gone somewhere else if they felt the need. And, but there's just no indication everything was okay. So I think it's, I, I, I appreciate it, I think it's a valid point. I don't think it's a deal killer. But some might, and I respect that, but I don't think so. Yes? Uh, um, Carl, uh, Carl's not in the room at the moment. You guys have folks come in uh, frequently. Um, I don't know how. I, so I'm from New Mexico, and Carl and I have been friends for a long time, colleagues. So I, I don't know quite how that works here, but uh, they do have such. Is there a mailing list or something? How do, how do people know? Email. Email. How did you find out? Um, okay. 
Good for you. Thank you very much. So, um, so I guess, uh, I, I guess, Carl, the, we, should we try to get email addresses from people or something, Carl? They want to come back for more lectures that you're going to have here. Okay. Okay. So, um, and, and especially if some events coming, you know, you'd pass that on. Yes. Okay. That's why I haven't gotten any. Okay. So, so over in the museum, which is right there, um, there's a, right inside the door. There's something to, to sign on. So please do. And it's a biblical garden. I'll be glad to talk to anybody here, on your way over, over there. If you want to talk, I'll be glad to do it. Thank you for coming.